What's up, guys? Welcome back to Between the Zones. Today, we're going to be doing an interview with uh, ex-NFL player and TikTok uh, star right now, Hakeem Vales. We're going to make sure to link everything that he has, his TikTok, his Instagram uh, down below. He is a huge entrepreneur right now. He's doing amazing things in the business world, along with the sports world. Make sure you guys check him out. And I think we can go ahead and just get into the interview. Yeah. So uh, uh, thank you for joining us, Hakeem. This means a lot for us. Gentlemen, super, super excited to be here. Yeah. So I think uh, this is a question we try to start off most of our podcasts with um, because because I'm 18 and Will's 17 and we're just we're kids trying to make in the business right now. When you were our age, were you doing anything specifically like because, of course, you made it into the NFL, but you're also like uh, pretty successful with your, your your business side of things. Were you doing anything this early on or was it more of just like you were just you were just m- moving at your own pace? For me, honestly, I've always been an entrepreneur. So like it started when I was in middle school. Like I was the kid who had two backpacks. One was filled with Skittles and the other one was uh, books. And I, everyone came to my locker to go buy some Skittles, like to get their, their fix of Skittles for the day. Right. Awesome. Uh, by the time I got to high school, it was a little bit harder in high school. Cause I went to boarding school for high school and we had school six days a week and it was hard as hell to be honest. And yeah right when I finished up high school when I was 18, like summer, like literally a few weeks after graduation, my little brother had cracked his iPhone four just to date myself for like the 10th time. And like, my dad was like, yeah, I'm not paying to fix that, but like, go, go, go get it fixed yourself. And I like grabbed it and I was like, let me check it out and uh, uh, see what's up with it. Cause at that time, this is 2011, YouTube had a whole bunch of how to videos. Like that was like the trending thing. And I just, I just binged like a bunch of how to videos. And I was like, maybe there's like a how to fix iPhone video on there and found one. And they were like, yeah, you go to Amazon you can find a screen for 30 bucks. And I was like, wait, what? And I like buy the screen prime isn't even out yet. So it takes like two weeks to come in and I'm like all antsy because I can't wait. Cause I think like, man, this could be a business. I don't know. And take I take his phone apart and like put it back together it takes me about six hours but when i press that lock button on the side it worked and it turned on holy shit like this is the this is a business like i was like i'm like immediately took my phone out of my back pocket took it apart put it back together took it apart put it back together over and over and over and over again until i could do it from six hours to literally 20 minutes and then when i showed up as a college freshman like at monmouth university I was the iPhone repair guy. I fixed three to four phones a day. Um, and like, that was my thing. And like transition from that to learning that, oh, I, I knew that it probably would harm the environment if I took those cracked screens and put them in the trash. So I saved them all. And one just rain, rainy day, I like Googled what I could do with these cracked iPhone screens. And there was this company in Alabama that would buy my screens for five bucks a screen. And again, I was like, holy shit. Like this is a year after I've been fixing phones and I'm like, there's no, like if I'm just knowing this, what about all the iPhone kiosks, the mall kiosks, like the the little stores and all that? They for sure can't know. So I went to every one like 30 minutes away from my school and bought their screens from them for $2 and 50 cents and went and packaged them in my dorm room for five bucks a screen. And I made that I made more money doing that than I did actually fixing screens because I made like, cause I'm talking trash bags on trash bags on trash bags of cracked yeah, screens yeah. from all these repair shops and just flipping them to like buy for two fifty, sell for five, like hundreds of hundreds of times over and over again. That's awesome. When I was 17, 18, that, that's the type of things I was doing. Yeah. Yeah. So you were hustling from a young age is what you're saying. Is in my DNA? hundred <laughs> percent. What are some of the steps you took or you recommend for young athletes if they want to become pro? Ooh, that's a great question. Like for young athletes that want to become pro, I'm like, like my best piece of advice is match, match the, match the audacity like of your dreams, like with your work ethic, match the audacity of like your ambitions with your work ethic. Right. The NFL if I audit your week and it doesn't match that, and then I just think you're full of shit, in which most people are. Yeah. Nice on paper. I'm going to grind. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I'm just like, what did you do last week? Or 
did you work out today? Because it's snowing and raining. Oh no, it's snowing and raining. My mom doesn't want my shoes to get dirty. And I'm like, yeah, you're not going to go pro. Like when perfect example, when I was in middle school, like I wanted to go to the NBA when I was a kid. Like I, I'm a die. Like I'm a, I'm, I, I think I'm better at basketball than I am at football. As crazy as that sounds, mm -hmm. but they cut sports from my middle school. And I knew that if I couldn't play, I couldn't practice. Like, how am I going to make it to the end? Like, literally, it's funny. It's funny we had the JJ Reddick conversation. Like, it's so, like, full circle, super meta. Back then, like, my dream was to go to Duke University and then go to the NBA. And, I and like, at one point, I wanted to move to North Carolina because I knew that 94% of Duke students lived in North Carolina. And, and like, from like, North that's Carolina. How, that's how strong, like, I was set on, like, going to Duke. But... My bus, when I was in middle school, came at 6.30 every morning. At 4.30 every single morning, I woke up and my dad used to take me to LA Fitness and I'd literally work out for an hour and a half, get my shots in, get my workout in, all that. And I am literally 12, 13, 14 years old. Wow. Uh, that young kid, that's what it takes. Yeah, so, uh, dang, that is, that is a lot of work. But yeah, I mean, I, I like what you're able to say. It's just like, you have to be able to match what you want there is work that goes with it and you got to be able to, you got to be able to hit it. Um, so you, you were, you were working hard from like super young, but m moving on through like your years, moving on to high school and to college and stuff, how did that change? Like, was it a lifestyle change that had to happen? Because of course, like once you, once you're in college and, and you're trying to go pro and playing football, it's, it, it really becomes part of your life, but was it a lifestyle change or was it really just like having more time to commit to that? For me, it was, I mean, I don't know if you guys know this, I was a bench player my first three years of college. Did not see the field my freshman year, sophomore year, junior year. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was when my little brother went to the NFL. It was like, a, if he can do it, I can do it. Like My little brother dropped out of UVA as a 20-year-old sophomore and got drafted to the Oakland Raiders in the sixth round. And I was just like, I used to share a bathtub with that same kid. And if he can do it, I can do it. And that that was one factor. And then the other factor was after I finished my senior year and in between my senior year and my red shirt senior year, I went on a missionary trip and we were out in Haiti and our compound got ambushed by eight guys with guns. I got shot at point blank range, hogtied, blindfolded, pissed myself the whole nine yards. It was wild. And overcoming that really put me in a place of if, like, how do I explain it? If, I'm not dead right now. I could and should be dead right now, but I'm not. So why yeah. wouldn't I grind? Why wouldn't I take that extra rep? Why wouldn't like when I'm training, it's like, yeah, these gassers suck, but I'm not tied up covered in my own piss. Yeah. These weights suck. This schedule sucks. All this sucks, but I know I could and should be dead. And like with that mindset, it, uh, it was, uh, it wasn't hard, but it was, it wasn't easy, but like that helped. I've got a, a, a kind of follow up to that. A lot of people have like different things that motivate them. And it seems like, like being hog tied and ha held at point blank range seems like a pretty good motivator. What, what would you say that was probably your biggest motivator? Like to, to keep working once you were older? Oh yeah. Cause I mean today, like not a day goes by where I don't think about it. Like, yeah. you know, you're lazy, boom, boom, boom. And it's just like, it's a, it's a perspective tweak on a daily basis, it, like framed through gratitude. Like, yes perfect example i lost a six thousand dollar a month client last week wow. sucks it stings right that's that's what's that 60 72 000 a year right there gone yep. who but i'm not dead yeah yeah you know what i'm saying like sucks for a second yeah but you're not you're like being able to go back to that place understanding that i am literally blindfolded can't understand the language that's being spoken right now and I know I'm going to die. Like it's about to happen. And that didn't happen. That's nothing is worse than that for me. So it's like going through day to day life. It's like, yeah, client fired me. Cool. Girlfriend cheated on you. Cool. This happened. Cool. You're still alive. Still going. Oh, wow. yeah, that's great to hear. What are some of the best personality traits or characteristics players can have to find success in the NFL? Ooh, <laughs> it's a loaded one. It's a good question, though. I, I would honestly say situational awareness. 
most people don't have that. And self-awareness as well. Situational awareness, meaning understand the room, read the room, understand the team, understand the egos that are there. Because if you can't manage that internally, it's hard to survive in an NFL locker room. Because it's just, it's a lot. It's a lot yeah. of stimuli, if that makes sense, from a lot of different angles. Um, and then self-awareness is tripling down on what you're best at. Because you need to be good at that, and that's what teams need to be good at for you so you can be the best player. If you know you're best at X, Y, Z, no matter what anyone else says, then you need to be the best at that and demonstrate that on the field. But some people aren't, and some people try and keep up with the Joneses once they're there, like, oh, this guy runs routes like this. Let me try that. It's good to do those type of things, but it's also good to double down and triple down on what you yourself is are best at because that's why you made it in the first place. Do you think that applies to, like, more than just football? Uh, let's say for, like, business or whatever. If if you're an expert at something, you just need to – being, being specialized uh, could be more valuable than just being all right in everything? Debatable because – I think self-awareness is critical, but self-awareness means understanding yourself. Meaning I know I'm good at football, but I'm not happy playing football. So I retired. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Like, or business wise, like we specialize in podcast production six months ago as a company, Perspective Global Media. TikTok took a turn. My account did really, really well. I know what my long-term dreams are with my business. I understood that TikTok would help me get my foot in the door with some of these larger brands that I want to work with. So we pivoted just self-awareness. And it was self-awareness of the fact that being a podcast production company, we had 12 employees. I felt like I had to be an HR manager and manage everybody and like micromanage. And it felt like I wasn't doing what I was best at, which is being on the front, which is why we changed our business model to a consulting agency. So now we charge for access to my time versus my time was all spent on finding leads and clients. And then it was put into a podcast production process. That kind of makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that's some pretty great advice. Um, I want to go back to a question we, we asked just a second ago. We were talking about like personality traits and self-awareness and stuff. You, you were in the NFL and you got to play with some, some like pretty big players. What would be your greatest example of a player that really like took took the right traits and maybe maybe just like knew what they were supposed to be, took his right traits and, and made a career out of it. Mm. Darren Fells. Darren Fells? Darren Fells. Tight end Darren uh. Fells. I don't know if you know this. Darren Fells played professional basketball overseas for years before he came into the NFL. I did not yeah, know, I didn't that. know that either. College basketball player, I believe, at UC Irvine and then played overseas in a whole bunch of different countries and then his brother is Danny Fells from the Giants he used to like he was I think he was on the Giants store and like yeah he was I think he was in the game when Odell had that catch um back back in the day and got his brother's agent his brother's agent like mentioned like, hey or I don't know who mentioned like you might you might have a shot at playing in the NFL was able to get him on a practice squad and I think he bounced around like maybe two or three different teams as practice practice squad that could be wrong um and then once he got to arizona it was just the perfect fit he knew that he was best as a blocking tight end but he was also wildly athletic so he could also make great catches and he knew his role he was the blocker jermaine gresham was the catcher did his thing boom then like did his thing enough to go to detroit same thing he was the blocker eric ebron was the catcher boom did his thing, dove deep with that, uh, did really, really well, got paid when he went to uh, Cleveland. Same thing. He was the blocker, and Joku was the catcher, and they had another dude, uh, the white guy. What's his name? Tight end? Uh, Hooper? Is that his? No. Hooper's new. This is, um, this is, this was, this is back. This is eight, 18. Dude, I, I can see his face. I'm, like, yeah, I'm not sure, but... Now he's in the Texas and same thing, but now he's thriving as not only is he a blocker, he, dude's getting like at least three or four touchdowns a season, like the last, I don't know, three or four years, which is like super exciting. But he honed down on what he was great at, has always been the, like, since I've known him, has been the same super humble person, 
the, I mean, he taught me, I didn't say he taught me everything I know about fatherhood, because that's, you know, it's something that just comes intrinsically, but he witnessing him be a father when I was a rookie in the NFL really prepared me and geared me up to actually be a father, which is kind of, kind of cool. But he, he mentored me a large way through the NFL. Yeah. Awesome. So back on time when you were in the NFL, how did you personally prepare on game day? Were, were nerves a big factor or did you come in with a lot of confidence? Honestly, like game day is so, like it's it's crazy. Like you poop like seven times because you're <laughs> so nervous. But like yeah. you're not on the surface. You know you're like a hard shell. Like oh, I'm so tough. But like in yeah, you guys are NFL athletes. Yeah, inside though you're shitting yourself. You know what I mean? Like literally, yeah. you poop. Like ask any NFL. Ask. Oh, that's a good question. You might want to add to your interview. How many times do you poop before you came? Because when <laughs> I pump it. We'll make sure to make that a repeating question for anybody anybody else we get from the NFL or the NBA or anything like that. Well, what is the average average game day poop count? And it's crazy because there's some logistical nightmares that happen at some stadiums because there's not <laughs> enough toilets and like there's <laughs> three guys who all have to take dumps collectively. Yeah. You know what I mean, and it's like it's a lot. Like there's like a line outside of like every shitter. Um, and like you'll go find like a secret spot and like then there's still someone in there and it's just like oh my gosh i don't think i've ever contemplated like bathroom usage just being one of the big problems in pre-game that is a pre-game <laughs> logistical nightmare is bathroom usage. but my whole routine is uh you know i try and i try and stay as normal and on as as even keel as possible so if it's a home game like when I played for the Cardinals, for example, like we always went to this this spot called Crackers, um, just like just a breakfast spot um, in like it's crazy because like the team hotel was like a midpoint stadium is right here. Crackers is here. So we would literally morning of the game, leave the hotel, go to Crackers, go back to the hotel and then go to the stadium um, just to add that normalcy um, away games. You know, I, I always try to to. I don't know the meals because you know you're gonna have a super poopy day. <laughs> so, so but like, so you're trying to like almost be cognizant of like what you're eating, but you also want to make sure you're eating for fuel um, as well. So it's all of that takes into account, and then it's making sure you get your plays to a level of unconscious competence. So because every every week you've got a whole new set of plays that are up but do you know those plays like the back of your hand or is it still taking time to register? So usually it's going through the, you know, you'll have like your game day sheet of first plays, third down plays, uh, first and long, second and long, third and long plays, fourth and one plays, goal line, like every single package that's possible, understanding what, like first I always go through the plays that I'm gonna be on, then the plays I could be on, then the plays like in emergency situations that I could be on. And then it's okay. understanding all the the special teams nuances because something on that sense always changes every week. Um, so it's a lot because you can't mess up on game day. Like, yes, you can, but in my situation, like you can't like of, like yeah, you can you can drop the ball and stuff like that. But a mental error is inexcusable uh, exactly. at the professional right. level. So that that's where a level of the nerves come in and all that type of stuff come in. And then when it's you know once the lights come on and I usually would go out like there's two buses on away games that head to the stadium. Some people head on the super early bus and I wasn't a fan of that. Cause like, I'd rather be in my own world where I can control my environment for as long as possible before I'm like at the stadium. And now it's like, I'm in super like nerve wracking type of mode. So I'd always take the late bus over. Um, and then once I get into the locker room, it was, I'll spend majority of the time just like with my headphones on until it's time to, go on the field and stuff like that i tried i tried to spend as less as like you know you do a little lap you do i have my own like routine the same stretch routine i always did the same catches i would always like catch like pre pre-game and then it's you're in it like once pre-game starts like on tv it seems like damn like when's the game gonna start 30 minute running clock like it's literally once you first step on the field like game is about it feels like the game starts in like two minutes if that makes yeah. sense i've got a i've got a couple follow-up questions just because i want to know 
So, so firstly, I want to know what is because you talk about pregame meals and stuff. What has been your your absolutely favorite pregame meal you've ever had? Is it was it an away game or a home game or or what? What was that go to pregame meal you would definitely go back and have again? Uh, I don't even know if it was a pregame meal, but I always would go with the what do you call it? Just I'm simple, so I've always go with the salmon probably for the most part, but. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to. I'm. I'm literally picturing it. And I want to say it was in. Oh, Oakland. When we it was preseason, we did like joint practice with them, so we had the same caterers like all week and for the game and all of that. But they yeah. had. The, I believe they had this like pesto salmon, which was just like super super fire. All right, I got one more because you're talking about like once you're on the field, it's pregame stuff. You're listening to your music and stuff. What was your go-to warm-up song? Something that's gonna like really get you in the mindset for things, uh, just right before the game. Sail by Sail. A Wall Nation. Do, 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 do. Yeah, the, with the crazy bass. Yeah, I really like that song. That was my. You know, I was my song is because back when I was you guys' age, and you guys watched. I'm sure you guys watch college highlights all the time. Yeah. You know, like, right. The. I don't know which year it was highlight but it, tyron matthew was in college still at the time ellis yeah whole bunch of his highlights on it as all like call it like i'll listen to a ray of everything before the game i'll listen to country music i'll listen to uh uh what do you call it uh I've listened to classical music, but I've listened to reggae. Like I listen to a lot of like Bob Marley and stuff like that. Just relax me like six, six to like three hours before the game. But like that last song that goes on is going to be that. And then the next year college highlight from there, the, the song that was on it was, uh, it's so cliche, but I don't listen to it on the radio and stuff, but for football, counting stars. They, they, uh, yeah. like that song. <laughs> Gets me fucking juiced, bro. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, for anybody that doesn't know, we, we actually do highlights on our Instagram page, and, and we put it together for different players. And we were talking about doing one for you just because uh, uh, to, like, kind of commemorate doing this. So we will make sure when we do this highlight package, one, we'll, we'll send it to you, but two, it will either be sale or counting stars that we do this highlight package to. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. Well, you want to keep on going? Yeah. Uh, so more on the NFL, what is one moment – from your time that you're never ever gonna forget. Mm. Probably that first drop. That first drop. First drop was my first game. Like it was Thursday night football, Cardinals yeah. versus San Fran. And most people don't know it's like on primetime games versus a regular game. There's like 15 times more cameras out there and camera crews plus that dragon camera that slides all the way across the field yeah yeah yeah. yeah. i literally had back-to-back just emmys like literally had a play where i thought i would if i caught it i would have scored and went right through my hands very next play i did uh uh it was like a rub route concept with larry fitzgerald and i set a pick on his guy he catches it runs with it and offensive pass interference and it was like back-to-back plays but that will forever be like a, a moment of like man like it's, it's obviously like it's not like a negative moment, but like, yeah. it's like of everything that always stands out because it was first game and I had a great game. I think I was the highest rated tight end on the field that game, but that drop and that OPI crushed me. Yeah. So, so you mentioned like you did that rub route with Larry and I, I think Larry's pretty much just a beloved guy across all of football. Uh, is there is there ever been like a moment in your career like a like a story you're gonna tell your grandkids about a, a legend or something playing with Larry or just a, anybody else that's like it's gonna it's gonna transcend over the years and it's gonna be something you're proud to tell. Uh, about Larry, I'm trying to think. Larry was just like, I think it's just the human aspect that most people underestimate about all superstars. I and mean, like Les Larry is a great example, but just the human aspect of like, cause I mean, his locker was three, four things down. It's like, it's hard when you're in it to grasp and point out those specific moments because these are just, it's like your colleagues slash classmates. Like if one of your classmates that you knew was 
YouTube or TikTok famous, it wouldn't be that big of a deal if that kind of makes sense. Because they're normalized to you. Because they're normalized to you. You eat breakfast with them. You eat lunch with them. You go out to dinner with them. You travel with them. You go to parties with them. Like it's, it's not like uh, it's, but the human aspect of Larry always being that same person, if that makes sense. He was just always a just a kind, compassionate dude. But what always stood out stood out to me was, and I made a TikTok about this is like the victory is in the preparation, like being around some of the best athletes in the world, you get to witness what does their actual routine look like? Why is Larry diving for balls and getting hurt on Fridays? But then like, that's why no one on the sideline is not impressed because everyone's obviously impressed. No one's surprised when he makes those wild catches week in and week out because he literally does that every single day. No one's surprised when Pat Peterson leads the league. He doesn't lead this year, I don't think, but leads the league in interceptions when you see him working on hands more than a receiver. Do you know what I'm saying? And it's like yeah. Yeah. that aspect of it, of just the, the, the human aspect, meaning like, I guess no moment was too small for those guys. Cause you know, some other people, some moments are almost too big, but it's like no moment was too small for Larry. Kind of always, always, always a human like joke about the fact that i had a drop ball and then an OBI <laughs> yeah. versus like on you if that makes sense <laughs> kind of bringing it back to the marketing side of things how did you uh manage or juggle being an nfl athlete and an entrepreneur at the same time oh uh, it was hard that's why i retired once i had a kid i couldn't balance being an entrepreneur a dad and an athlete um right. it's hard uh mainly just going insular and cocooning and honestly just not i never kept up with the joneses when i played so like as soon as i was done with football for the day like i was home and i was working on what i wanted to work on entrepreneurial wise and all that type of stuff wise i haven't played video games since i was in middle school so that really helped so it wasn't like like your average player plays video games as soon as they get home and it's like nothing not, nothing wrong with it everyone has their own version of escapism <clears throat> and uh but for me like balancing it was it came down to honestly like it was hard like when i was on the lions like i would literally go to the facility and like it's so funny because uh where is it i literally just saw it uh, it's, it's over there but my uh my playbook is was, was over there but half of the plays like half of the sheets it's dallas cowboys who to look out for leighton van Der Esch, this guy that guy other half of the sheet is me breaking down by hand analyzing like a rental property like real estate wise and like i would put them in like the notebook the night before so when i'm in meetings at the point where i was like super checked out i'm not even paying attention to the meeting i'm literally breaking down like a property like on my like in my notes because it looks like i'm taking notes but i'm really yeah doing hand underwriting a real estate project wow <laughs> that's pretty crazy um so so for anybody that doesn't know uh or doesn't follow your pod or your tiktok like you you've told the story before about how how you went out and you bought that that quadplex or, or when you were when you're still playing and that's a that's a pretty crazy thing to do um what what is something because i i just want to know uh, a lot of us uh Business and entrepreneurial entrepreneurship seems like a, a great place to be, especially if you're like really advanced in it right now. What is something for uh, the the common person that maybe isn't super into to that side of things? What is one thing that everybody should know to like be able to boost your your financial and your business literacy and stuff? Uh, super high level and then i'll go tactical is if you don't have financial literacy you will inevitably go broke that's one uh but like just a tactical nugget most people take a huge sense of pride in buying their first house i'm a homeowner american dream blah blah blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. and the main loan that's pushed onto people for their first house is a first time home buyer loan, which tells you you can put down three and a half percent. But what your average human does not know is that the loophole with that first time home buyer's loan 
is that you can also put down three and a half percent on a duplex, triplex, or fourplex. So I always say the ultimate unlock, if you don't have kids and like, if you are okay with living in different neighborhoods in different spots, like the neighborhood I lived in my rookie year when I had that fourplex, like we had sec, I had section eight tenants living in my building. And I, how do I explain? <clears throat> Taking advantage of that will give you a head start in my opinion in life, because one, now you, outside of I'm a homeowner, you actually a property owner and now your house, yes, there's assets and liabilities and yes, your house can technically be an asset, but that asset can fluctuate when the market drops and now your value drops and you're still paying the same mortgage versus if you have a fourplex and the market drops and the value of that property drops, your tenants are still paying you rent and you're still covering your mortgage and you're still potentially cash flowing. And what people don't realize with a, but a mortgage is you're paying into a bank account by paying like loan pay down is a pillar of wealth creation that's ignored because most people don't understand it. Meaning if my loan value is 200,000, but over three years, I pay that loan down to 170,000, but not me, my tenants pay it down to 170,000. Mm -hmm. And then three years later, I sell it for 200,000. Let's say I didn't sell it for anything more. I still make 30,000 because my tenants paid into that bank account, that asset, not to mention the cash flows you'll see, not to mention the uh, tax benefits you'll see, and not to mention if you actually bought the property right and that property appreciates in value and the appreciation, the, the, the appreciation that you'll see in that sense. Awesome. Yeah, it's really good to hear. Um, we know you're not in the league currently, but there, are there any aspects of the game you really miss and are you eager to come back? The aspect of the game that I miss uh, is game day. Game day is yeah. there's nothing like that exhilaration of energy. Um, I also miss the, it's nice now being on TikTok and building an audience that you can have that. It's a, it's a parallel feeling of the effect that I can give to someone when mm -hmm. I comment on their post, when I get, throw them a follow, when I respond to their comment, when I do something like that, that, oh my gosh, he just blah, 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 blah. That is one of the greatest feelings in the world to do to someone. Yeah. And that's the feeling you like personally gave us too. I just wanted to say that real quick. Like the moment you responded to, to Connor's comment, um, like we had that same, like just exhilaration of uh, Hakeem Vales responded to us. That kind of, that kind of thing. The power of that is definitely what I miss because like same thing back when I was playing, when you're in it, you don't realize the power you have, but you still do it. Like I used to do community service events every single week, but meeting people, doing different things, hanging out with kids, having a catch with some kids and stuff like that, just off the simple fact that you play in the NFL can genuinely make that person's day. I definitely miss that because I knew back when I was a kid, I, I told this story before, back when I was a kid, my I was a die, I'm a diehard Eagles fan. Mark, Mike Bartram was the backup long snapper for the Eagles back in the day. He was probably, I think it was read across America and he was reading a book like in our elementary school to my little brother's classroom, who's not even an Eagles fan. But because of the fact that an Eagles player breathed the same air as me because he was in our school, didn't even get to meet this dude. Yeah. And here I am 20 years later telling you that story that's the that's the kind of impact you can have yeah and the fact that i can now do that on tiktok just while i'm taking a poop or while i'm in bed or whenever <sighs> just responding it's it's staggeringly surprising that other athletes don't do it and it's in my opinion why most athletes are vulnerable they are taking their clout and they're just keeping it and yeah, yeah. i arguably have more super fans than a player who's 10 times better than me, made 10 times more money than me, and in the from a perception standpoint, has more popularity than me, but doesn't actually have real super fans, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, the fact that you were able to reach out to us, like, uh, if I was to say probably like, uh, I don't know, a couple months ago, uh, three, four, five, six months ago, uh, I w when I wasn't watching your TikTok, um, just based off of like what I what I would have seen in, in highlights or something like that compared to another player that 
the impact you would have had wouldn't wouldn't have been as great. But now, like like speaking to you makes makes a complete different. Yeah. Just you're a pretty awesome person, uh, <laughs> and this is this has been one of our most fun TikTok or uh, most fun interviews anyway. Um, but yeah, I I would have to agree that the whole super fan aspect it's just your ability to reach out it really means a lot to a lot of people. This is why I'm excited to go back and play too. Because now taking this, understanding the digital platforms, understanding that, man, I can have a lot of fun with the audience now and the fans now and just like do all types of just cool, fun stuff, which would just be like, I'm, I'm like wildly excited about that. Yeah. So one thing, uh, we're going to go ahead and try to wrap things up in, a, in just a second because we know you're a busy guy. But we were talking just off the podcast about your business and a, and a partnership you guys are doing with the American uh, Heart Association. Cancer Society. Cancer. Yeah. So, so we um we just wanted to to say that you had explained to us that there there is um an open raffle and and you can explain it probably a little bit better than we can uh just to donate and potentially win a chance to go see the the Super Bowl this year or next year if you delay it. Yep, all expense paid trip uh 10 bucks uh the NFL partnered with ACS and they're doing an auction uh to essentially 10 bucks is your raffle ticket to join the auction and essentially win a chance to win a trip to go all expenses paid to Super Bowl hotel everything and if because of covid you don't want to go uh you can postpone it to next year for LA yeah LA yeah yeah and that's awesome and and we're going to make sure that we we keep like repeating this throughout our videos because this is a really important thing it's a great cause and and why not you can you can go to the Super Bowl and uh, and that and that's a, that's a pretty amazing thing well if you want to go ahead and hit him with just our our final, final question. question if you were to tune into our podcast who would you personally want to see as a guest and does it have to be an athlete it does not it can be it could be an athlete athlete it could be a friend it could be your uh, a guy you grew up with it could be a business uh executive it can really be anything honestly because i think you guys you guys ask really great questions i would want to see gary v as a guest on you guys this show gary v that would be a pretty huge podcast um sports massive jets fan i think he would be an awesome guest on the show well uh you heard it here from hakeem vales we're <laughs> Our goal now will be to to get in contact with Gary V. Um, that that would be a pretty amazing interview. But yeah, I just uh, I wanted to say thank you and and this this really meant a lot to us. And yeah. make make sure you guys go check out Hakeem Villas. His TikTok will be in the description. And I, I think we're signing off. It's been between the zones. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you guys for watching. And and yeah. See ya.